we're privileged to have with us Professor Jean Tirole. He's one of the most distinguished economists in the world with a Nobel Prize in 2014. And he's a professor at Toulouse School of Economics and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He received his Nobel Prize for groundbreaking work on market power and regulation. But his work is much broader than that, as is revealed in his latest book called uh, Economics uh, for the Common Good. This book ranges extraordinarily wide. It ranges from climate change, moral limits of markets, the European project, uh, the financial crisis of 2008. But we're interested in Marshall here in two aspects of his work, two specific aspects. So if I could turn to you, Jean, and talk about those two aspects. Jean, um, we, uh, there are two areas of your work where you've made some major contributions in which we at Marshall are deeply interested in. One of those concerns altruism, the altruism of individuals, but the other concerns, in some sense, the altru another aspect of altruism, the altruism of corporations and corporate social responsibility. So if we could begin, I could just ask you a question or two about uh, the altruism of individuals. Now, you have particular views, I know, on the drivers of altruism that individuals have. I take it you don't think that individuals are totally selfish, uh, and, um, but perhaps you could tell us a bit about um, what you think uh, drives people when they're engaging in altruistic behavior. Well, that's actually uh, very important to understand if we want to go beyond homo economicus. We, we want to understand why people participate in, in the various uh, volunteering activities, mm -hmm. in charities, they give to charities, mm -hmm. uh, they do lots of things that actually are not fully self-interested. Uh, but we also have to account for the evidence. And the evidence, there's a lot of evidence nowadays uh, from experiments by psychologists, but also by economists, uh, documenting the fragile uh, fragility of uh, altruism as a whole. Uh, so sometimes people can be very altruistic and sometimes very selfish. So we have to understand that. Narratives and, and frames are actually very important in, in affecting uh, pro-social behavior, for example. Mm -hmm. So in collaboration with Roland Benabou, we, um, we try to develop a model in which you have basically three drivers of altruism. Mm -hmm. uh, the first driver is just intrinsic altruism, intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. We just want to, to do good. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is, is just extrinsic motivation just money, so you are being paid, for example, to give your blood, mm -hmm. so you, or you, you, you get a tax deduction for you know, giving mm -hmm. to a charity. And the third one, perhaps a newer one, is the image concern. And the image concern can be either self-image concern or social image concern. So self-image concern, of course, I go back to Adam Smith and his impartial spectator spectator with insiders, so we, we try to assess ourselves, you know, we want to feel like decent persons, for example. So we, we are concerned about our self-image, and we're also concerned about our social image, uh, so what other people think about us. I and mean, there's a lot of evidence, of course, showing that people are much more pro-social when they are observed by their peers, by their family, by their colleagues, than if they are just by themselves. Yes, do you, I, I think that's very interesting, the idea that, that we have both an image of ourselves to protect uh, and to reinforce, mm. and also an image that others. And what are the implications of this, do you think, for reward structures, for performance-related pay, for those kind of things? Uh, is there a risk that we actually drive out the first of the things you mentioned, intrinsic motivation, and how does it affect the, the other two drivers you mentioned, external motivation and also... Um, the image question. So as you know, classical economics just assume that if you pay more, then the supply is going to increase. So uh, if you, for example, pay people for giving their blood, then they will give more blood. Mm -hmm. And this is not the case, in, always the case in practice. Uh, and I must say there is a lot of heterogeneity in behavior too, but uh, there are also experiments that show that uh, actually if you pay people, at least you don't pay enough, <laughs> then that can backfire and actually they may give less blood, especially among the women actually. It's very interesting uh, oh. to, to observe that. That's an interesting point. They, yeah. Because I guess, and nobody knows why actually, we, knew, mm -hmm. we should test that, but uh, 
women's uh, are more prosocial, that's a fact as well, <laughs> than men. And probably their image as being prosocial is also more important because that's part of their identity, probably more than for mm -hmm. men. But it's just a conjecture, I have no clue whether it's <laughs> true. Um, but it's very important to, to realize that sometimes in some domains, actually you can have a crowding out effect, as you mentioned, of incentives on the supply. So it may be the case that uh, you pay people and they actually give less blood, for example. And the mechanism is through the image concern. So, for example, if I'm being paid, you don't know whether I'm giving blood because I'm a generous person or because I'm a greedy person, I'm doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. So that's what psychologists call over-justification. So we, you know, it becomes unclear whether you do it because you are generous, I'm, because I'm doing it because I'm generous or because I'm just greedy and I want the money. Do you think, so do you think that people need to be perceived to be making a sacrifice uh, in what they're doing uh, in order to convince themselves and indeed to convince others that they are actually being altruistic? Yes, there is some of that, of course, because mm -hmm. if, if that person is being paid, you discount the act of, uh, of it giving. It doesn't feel like altruism. It doesn't feel like altruism. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And what, what happens is that over, you know, if you pay a little bit, it may actually backfire. If you pay a lot anyway, that, that will... Well, you'll <laughs> get the response. You'll you get the response <laughs> that you, is to be expected. But that means that mm -hmm. in domains in which image concerns are very big, mm -hmm. then incentive can, uh, can backfire. Yes. So we've got to properly design our incentive yes. structure to make sure we don't get that backfiring. Exactly. On the social responsibility of corporations, which is another great area of, our, of, of martial interest, or more generally the social mm -hmm. responsibility, you make the point that uh, in your book that um, the shareholding corporation is the dominant, by far the dominant, uh, f type of firm, type of governance that we have uh, in Western society. Um, and yet, of course, it's subject to innumerable criticisms. And indeed, there are a variety of other forms of organisations, social enterprises, mutuals, cooperatives, many of whom have demonstrable advantages, higher productivity, better customer service, better employee morale than the shareholder-owned corporation. And yet, the shareholder corporation is dominant. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, at first, I think we should have a level playing field across organizational forms. So um, it should not be a, a decision of society, for example, to favor the shareholder corporation. If other forms are more efficient, that, that's better, and we should let them uh, appear. Uh, I think part of the reason why the shareholder corporation is so, so dominant, in a sense, is, is financing concerns. Uh, you know, one of the big issues when you finance a firm is whether you'll get the, your money back, in a sense, you'll mm -hmm. see your money back. And therefore, the investors tend to structure the contract, the lending contract, uh, so as to have guaranteed that they will get their money back. So, for example, uh, the governance, governance structure of the board of directors is surrounds ar around shareholders, for example. And if mm -hmm. shareholders don't repay their debt, then it will be the debt holders. But in any, in any case, that those will be the investors. And that has problems, of course, because there is no reason why shareholders or, or debt holders mm -hmm. actually should internalize the welfare of workers, of the communities, uh, of the environment, and so on. So it's very important that actually we also have a mechanism that is going to protect uh, those stakeholders if, you, if we go for the shareholder route. But I think financing is a key, so the key finance driver. And finance and capital, you think, is yeah, really Yeah, because the issue. We, we see, for example, we see with family-owned firms, and you mentioned mm -hmm. other interesting forms mm -hmm. like cooperatives and the like, mm -hmm. but family-owned firms, for example, the evidence is that those firms who want to keep, uh, which want to keep control, those entrepreneurs who want to keep control, they have a harder time getting financing. Mm -hmm. So they may sacrifice scale in order to do other things, like, for mm -hmm. example, protecting the jobs of their worker, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. So do you think, I mean, what do you think about the, uh, the Milton Friedman argument that, um, that corporations, shareholder-owned corporations, should not actually engage in social acts or should not actually be socially responsible? They should only concern themselves with maximizing shareholder value because that's what they're legally required to do. I'm, 
I've been very interested in corporate social responsibility, and actually since we are at LSE, uh, I gave eight years ago a lecture on my work with Roland Benabou on uh, corporate social responsibility. And th in that lecture, we distinguish between three types of corporate social responsibility. Mm -hmm. One, I think, is pretty non-controversial. It has to do with uh, sustainability, a kind of long-term view of the firm. It's a little bit of a reaction of various behaviors like Enron or, or the financial crisis where managers were getting short-term bonuses and mm -hmm. were maximizing short-term profit as opposed to maximizing long-term profit. Mm -hmm. So um, there is this view that actually the shareholders should be involved in governance and also design comp compensation schemes that will induce managers actually mm -hmm. to behave for the interests of the corporation in the long run, which will have a spillover also in terms of the stakeholders because, for example, there will be less uh, risk-taking, risk uh, mm -hmm. financial risk-taking or environmental mm -hmm. risk-taking. That's the first vision, mm -hmm. basically a long-term vision of, of, of the corporation. corporation right. The second mm -hmm. vision is what we, de we call delegated philanthropy. So delegated philanthropy means that the corporation does charitable work on behalf of its clients, its clients being the customers. So for example, a coffee uh, chain, for example, will buy fair trade coffee and mm -hmm. will charge a little bit more the client. Mm -hmm. Or it could be socially responsible investment mm -hmm. in which um, the investors are willing to get a slightly smaller return in exchange of investment in green firms mm -hmm. or in good mm -hmm. firms. And the investors themselves want this. Yes, they, and they the are, investors want they this. They have social concerns. For and themselves. same thing, you know, an NGO mm -hmm. may pay lower wages because mm -hmm. the worker is willing to uh, get a lower wage in order to, mm -hmm. to work in a better firm, in a mm -hmm. sense, and mm -hmm. more generous firm. But that, again, is not controversial because, again, it's kind of profit maximization. Mm -hmm. You do philanthropy on behalf of the investor, on behalf of the worker, on mm -hmm. behalf mm -hmm. of the customer. Mm -hmm. But then there is a third notion, yes. which is the one you mentioned, which is the one which uh, attracts a lot of criticism from both the right wing and the left wing. So Milton Friedman said you should not do uh, you know, charity on behalf of the shareholders, you, do ch you should do charity with your own money. And Robert Reich on the left side of the political spectrum was very opposed to corporation doing anything which has to do with public policy. Indeed. <laughs> and. Uh, and this is, this is actually an interesting debate because um, if the government were doing its, its job and were you know, basically correcting market failures and being fully benevolent, then that would be fine. You, you don't need corporation to do charity or to invest in university and so on. But that's not the world we live in, unfortunately. Uh, the government is captured by various interest groups is not doing the right thing in terms of public policy, is pandering to the electorate, and so on and so forth. So we have market failures, but we also have government failures. And in that environment, that's different because then the corporations actually can substitute for the government failures and sometimes do things. I mean, we see that, mm -hmm. for example, with climate change, because in climate change we have a market failure, which is externality from pollution, but we also have a government failure, mm -hmm. which is that our governments don't do anything to fight climate change, mm -hmm. or don't do enough on average. So the corporation actually may do a little bit more, and they substitute for the government, and for universities mm -hmm. the same. You know, you, there is a big uh, stake for a country to invest in universities, mm -hmm. and if, uh, if the governments don't invest enough in knowledge mm -hmm. and in education, then of course the corporation can help. So there's no general answer to your question. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, in a perfect world where governments will be perfectly benevolent and competent, there will be no need for that kind of action. But that's not the world we live in. And you know, in many cases actually charitable giving by corporation mm -hmm. actually can improve mm -hmm. our world. Even in a free benight world though, even in a perfect world, we would want the corporation to conform to certain ethical norms, wouldn't we? Even, even ones that they weren't legally require. That's, well, they, you well, mean even, even from a long-term perspective. So, so he, yes, and that, then that's, that's linked with uh, 
on demand the whole morality of their manager. So in a sense, um, an as individual a, behaving as a, a, a as a corporate manager doesn't lose his or her moral uh, the claims on her on him or her for morality. That's right. I mean, at the end of the day, they're if, still even though they are operating for an impersonal corporation, right. they still have uh, their own morality. Yeah, that's that's that. true. So. In, Imagine that actually managers get better compensation, not short-term oriented, but more long-term oriented. But still, it's a case that they might do things that are not moral in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where their own morality is going to play a role. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and we are back to the individual morality. Oh, right. uh, yeah. And indeed, of course, in the image and, turn, and the long-term reputation of yeah. the corporation too, your, your point yeah. about the long-term, that, that long -term it might yeah. well be it's important for them to retain a moral stance because of their long-term reputation, which in turn will knock back um, favorably for their profits. Yeah. Yes. I, I had done actually some work, some completely independent work on mm -hmm. the reputation of, uh, of collectivities, of, of groups oh, yes. in general. Mm -hmm. um, and one application, of course, is to corporations. And you, know, very, you can very quickly lose your reputation, but it takes a long time sometimes to rebuild. <laughs> that. Yes, as we've seen, of course, with Volkswagen. And, uh, <laughs> Um, finally, um, a question about economics itself. You, you discuss very interestingly, I think, in the book, the, the sort of role of economics and the way economics is developing. Um, do you think that we are entering, in some sense, almost a, a kind of new era of economics? When, when I trained as an economist, and I, I suspect when you did, um, we, we had a very simple view of, of human behaviour. Basically, we had agents that maximised a single objective function. So, Consumers maximise their utility, firms maximise profits. Now, we've had the development of behavioural economics, which has, mm -hmm. in some sense, challenged the maximisation hypothesis mm -hmm. and said that we aren't really maximising or we aren't behaving as consistently as the maximisation hypothesis would predict. Um, uh, and now what the kind of work that you've been doing and um, to a lesser extent I've been doing too, is actually uh, looking at the second part of the hypothesis People aren't just simply engaged in a simple self-interested maximization activity. They are trying to maximize a multiplicity of objectives, yes. uh, both agents themselves, both individ consumers, individuals themselves, but also, as we've just been discussing, corporations and other, act other um, even governments mm -hmm. are trying to pursue a multiplicity of objectives. It's really, really a, an almost new kind of economics that we're developing to, uh, to take that forward. Or, is that, or am I being too, uh, too no, overstating? I, I, no, I think that it's, it's important that actually uh, economics is uh, reunifying itself uh, with other social sciences in a sense. And because there's a lot to learn from psychology and sociology and many other fields. So we want a richer model of, of homo economicus in a sense, and not one that always maximizes. Uh, self-interest given the information that he or she has. So we need a, a broader model, we need to extend our model. We don't want to forget completely the tools because the empirical evidence shows actually there's something to maximization yes. even in areas where we think the, it's not fully rational. So take the motivated beliefs for example so that we have a tendency to distort our beliefs to to believe what we want to believe, for example. Yes. And you know, have a rosy view of herself, have a rosy view of the world we live in. And sometimes, actually, it can be dysfunctional, but still. But there's always a purpose somehow. Yes. There's always a purpose. So we try to fight procrastination by thinking we're able to do it. You know, we try to think we have a bright future. We try to believe that uh, illness, uh, and deaths are not going to be a concern to us and our relatives, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So it's not like, it's not either completely irrational, so it's not mm -hmm. a random behavior, or irrational behavior. It has a purpose. So it's not the standard purpose we have in the economics textbook, but it has a purpose, and so we don't lose all parsimony, because the danger, of course, is by having a much bigger model of, of behavior, mm -hmm. then we could not be making any prediction so, so what we need to do is to expand the model uh, of, of, of the economic agents so as to incorporate all those observations. But, but not expand it so far it becomes empty. Exactly. Which is the great yeah. danger, isn't it? Exactly. Jean Tirole, thank you very much indeed. Right, Julian, thanks so much.